thank you for having me here, Aki, and the nice introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today to speak about some of the uh, work that we're doing at Micron, particularly the application of ILT and curvilinear masks and designs uh, for um, memory chips. Um, I'd like to share today with you uh, three main use cases that I'll cover during my talk. Uh, on how we're applying ILT as well as uh, curvilinear designs into uh, memory uh, masks uh, for critical layers. And I'll try to make a case why we need uh, curvilinear designs and particularly why now. Um, so that's a relevant question in the era of uh, multi-beam mask writers. Uh, but before I get started with the different use cases I wanna walk through today, I'd like to um, define some terms that I'll be using today uh, so that the use cases that I explain become more uh, easy to understand. Uh, what you see here on the, on the left hand side of the screen, it's a top down view of what a advanced memory design chip, uh, state of the art uh, DRAM actually. Um, and if you look at the uh, zoom in version of, of that corner, um, what you see there is uh, the three main areas that we distinguish in a memory chip. Uh, namely, the, the blue squares represent where the memory elements are, where we store the information, the bits. Uh, we typically call that the array core or the memory array core. Um, and surrounding those memory elements or, or array cores, uh, you can see this red streets, vertical and horizontal. That's where the read and write circuitry uh, lies. Uh, so the sense amplifiers to read the bits, as well as the row drivers to write those uh, memory elements. And lastly, the uh, bigger area in this picture in brown color, that's what we call the periphery circuitry, where the I.O., the power circuits, as well as the repair logic circuits uh, lie. Uh, in addition to that, that's where the paths are for communication to the external world um, uh, for this memory chip. Um, so with these definitions, I'd like to introduce a few um, use cases uh, that I think uh, every chip manufacturer that's considering ILT went through. Um, and uh, the reason why I think uh, people think of use cases in this way is because at first you want to minimize the complexity that you're introducing both into the OPC as well as the mask manufacturing uh, when you start using ILT and particularly very complex curvilinear ILT shapes. So the first use case is what we call a repair flow. Uh, basically what we do is we apply ILT only in the areas that it's critically necessary to apply ILT. The rest of the chip will get conventional OPC. We do this again to minimize the computational uh, cost of running a full ILT solution as well as the mask complexity. Uh, so we run uh, a hotspot check and we would only apply ILT in those areas. Uh, the next case is the memory array core where we use ILT to um, OPC or correct for proximity effects at the edges of the uh, memory cores, the blue areas. Uh, and thirdly, the, the third and fourth case are, are somewhat related. Uh, basically, it's applying OPC ILT in the areas of the read-write circuitry. This is more uh, similar to logic designs, uh, where in the case of the periphery in particular, there's not a lot of hierarchy that we can leverage. In the case of the memory array core, even the uh, the uh, read and write circuitry, the, the red streets here in this, in this graph, uh, there's a lot of hierarchy, very repetitive patterns that we can leverage in order to at least accelerate the computational part. Even though the mass complexity may still be high, the computational part of performing ILT, we can leverage hierarchy and thus uh, get it to uh, complete faster. So, uh, 
if, if I were to rate this in complexity, both from computational standpoint for IoT algorithms, as well as the mass complexity, this goes from up to bottom, with the top being the easiest, the bottom full chip IoT is the more complex one. So starting with the easier uh, first introduction into IoT, uh, I'd like to share this use case where uh, for a 3D NAND architecture, we're using a flow we call the hotspot repair flow, where we use a hybrid IoT and conventional OPC solution um, with blending between the interfaces between IoT and conventional OPC. Um, to produce a, a solution that has more process window than what we can achieve with conventional OPC. So in the, in the graph here in the left, you can see part of this routing layer design where we, uh, by use of a model, we identify which are the areas that will need improved process window or the hotspots, we mark them and in those areas, we will limit the um, IoT application. I should say that in 3D memory architectures, incoming topography from previous steps, these are very, very high aspect ratio chips. Um, it's a problem. So the, the topography incoming is a problem. So we need to guarantee that we have additional depth of focus budget in order to compensate for that uh, incoming topography. So features that normally would print okay in planar architectures and 3D memories are, are a problem. Uh, and we tend to see this, uh, especially in very low K1, very aggressive lithography layers like this one in particular, where we are at the edge of the immersion resolution. Uh, we have to use very aggressive illumination and that results in weak spots, both at the uh, uh, jogs between metal tracks, uh, both uh, at 90 degree jogs as well as 45 degree jogs, we tend to see pinching areas and uh, also line progressions coming from dense line space patterns to isolated line spaces, uh, we tend to see uh, weak sides as well. So what we do is we apply um, ILT in order to both correct as well as to retarget the solution. And this is uh, part of the innovation here is that we're using ILT to retarget the shapes of the incoming mass design so that we can guarantee a minimum uh, process window or, or maximize depth of focus. In addition, I want to call your attention, there is uh, this area here uh, where you can see the 90 degrees jogs that have been retargeting to produce a smooth transition of a one uh, track jump. Uh, so this is very common in logic that you have to uh, step your metal routing one track or two tracks so that that will produce different lengths of jogs and again these are the weak spots with very aggressive uh, quadrupole illumination so having this smooth or more curvilinear shapes uh, really help with the overall process window. As I show in this plot, uh, the uh, process window of the limiting sites uh, has been increased by 60%, a, a roughly 10% uh, exposure light. And so we, we uh, can increase the depth of focus that helps uh, to mitigate that incoming topography. This is simulation data, but uh, in manufacturing, of course, we run focus exposure matrices to probe, and we, we can uh, corroborate this same level of uh, improvement on wafer. Now, um, I kind of touched on retargeting jogs as curves in order to improve process window. So what else does Curvilinear brings to the table? Uh, first is on the assist feature side, we see that less constraints on the solution uh, provide improved process window, meaning that if you let the algorithm, ILT naturally wants to create curvilinear shapes. So if you don't constrain that to Manhattan shapes, you end up with a better solution overall. Uh, the second one is speed of computation. Uh, Again, the, the ILT field is, is curvilinear by nature, so having to Manhattanize or, or make shapes in X and Y directions for mask making uh, adds additional complexity. And we, we can save up to 50% of the runtime if, if we just uh, skip that step. And thirdly, 
we have higher consistency of the solution. One thing that we've noticed, and I think it's industry-wide knowledge, is that small perturbations in the IoT field, after you go through the Manhattanization step, may result in big differences in the mask. Uh, so you can see one example here where you end up with two different, quite different solutions just trying to enforce MRC and Manhattanization uh, solution. Now, uh, why now? Why, why curvilinear now? ILT, since the very beginning, was proposed as a curvilinear solution, but at the time, the mask riders weren't ready to take that level of data complexity. Uh, so we had to, to manufacture a mask with variable shape beams. We had to fracture the data, uh, especially uh, fracture it in very small shots if you wanted to reproduce a curvilinear shapes as close as possible. And that not only resulted in a very long runtime or, excuse me, write time of the mask, which may have uh, signatures uh, because of the long process time uh, with CD, long range CD uniformity issues, but also uh, small shots that were required to produce curvilinear shapes were resulting in a, a high level of variability shot to shot that contributed to local CD uniformity variation. That was bad for the wafer. Um, now, with multi beam mask writer instead of state of the art uh, mask writing tools today, uh, that is not a problem anymore. Uh, basically, uh, write time for a multi beam tool is independent of mask complexity. The uh, mask is written as pixels, so we don't care about shots being too small. Uh, we don't care about the density of shots. Uh, mask will write in the same amount of time. Uh, so, this is uh, a game changer. It's an enabler for this technology. Uh, not only that, but we've We've seen, we've demonstrated that uh, the wafer CD uniformity coming from curvilinear masks is better than from BSB uh, written masks. And let me uh, go into a little more detail about this. Um, in this case, we run an experiment where we created uh, many different test structures uh, in, in a sort of a, a typical DRAM or NAND memory array configuration where we uh, basically created a set that the design was curvilinear in nature. Uh, the top row here, you see the target mask uh, data was created as circles or, or a slight ellipses. And uh, the bottom case, uh, we use a traditional Manhattan square shape or rectangular shape, slightly rectangular. Uh, we wrote those masks and we uh, created different mask biases. We exposed those test structures to different doses and we measured the CD variation on wafer. What we found was that uh, across dose and across mask bias, the uh, CD variation or local CDU of, of the resulting images on wafer was uh, consistently improved by using curvilinear shapes. And we're attributing this to um, a more consistent corner rounding on the mask. Uh, as you can see, some of the squares have uh, varying degrees of corner rounding, and that contributes to local CD uniformity that gets translated into wafer uh, contact CD uniformity. So we saw uh, an improvement of about 10% just switching uh, the target shape uh, for the mask. Now, additional benefits of this is that when you're calibrating an OPC model, you have to sometimes compensate because the mask shape, the intended mask shape, is not really what you're getting on the mask. The, the corners of features are rounded. Um, you, you may need to compensate for that. So by not having that difference, if you're using curvilinear shapes, not having the difference between the mask intent versus what you're getting on mask, that results automatically in a better OPC model. Now, there are some challenges, uh, specifically in the EDA infrastructure. We, we don't have tools that fully support curvilinear designs. Moreover, we don't have file formats that fully 
support curvilinear designs. Of course, you can use OASIS file formats, but they're not really designed for handling large amounts of curvilinear data. So file format is inefficient. Uh, layout tool support for curvilinear targets are not there yet. We can certainly draw circles, but we can't just do routing with any kind of curvilinear shapes, uh, or at least not easily. And uh, MRC compliance check is also a problem um, for efficiency. Uh, now, from the mask making side, uh, having to deal with this very large databases or files is also a problem for uh, or potential problem for uh, database to mask inspection uh, of the masks after write. Um, so let me now walk you through the second application case I wanted to cover today. Uh, this is a memory array. This is a real uh, chip design, a DRAM chip design, uh, where it's very crit critical to maintain the shape uh, through dose and focus of these edge, edge of array features. Uh, not only the shape, but also the centroid of where these features are. So the co-design of the assist features on this block layer, as well as the OPC on this uh, array live features is very critical to ensure that their shapes don't change through dose and through focus as well as their uh, centroid, where they lie. Uh, if, if they were to move around, that would result in memory bits shorts, and that may cause chip defectivity or yield impact. Um, if we were to look at that particular corner, in this case, I'm showing conventional OPC on the left side of the screen and the full chip ILT version on the um, right-hand side of the screen. And I should say that in order to manufacture this mask, we use a small step Manhattanization, even though the ILT solution was curvilinear, we did Manhattanize this to make the mask. Uh, but that's, that's not the point I'm trying to illustrate. What I'm trying to illustrate is that uh, the unconstrained solution, and particularly the co-optimization of assist features and main features, result in a much better um, uh, shape of the contacts through the dose and focus. As you can see in the PV band of all these contours, they tend to stay more round and closer to the target in green than in our uh, conventional case. This is the best uh, approach we had using conven conventional methods where you can see some of the contours are far from target or uh, shape elasticity starts creeping in at defocus conditions. So we could improve process window by about 35% in this particular case uh, for the corner contacts. And now moving on to the third use case I wanted to uh, share today. This is a, a more complex case. It's a full uh, periphery and uh, read-write uh, array circuitry uh, where we applied full curvilinear ILT and uh, created a mask to compare our uh, best conventional OPC solution to the fully curvilinear solution. What you see in this uh, dot plot in the center of the screen is in, uh, in blue, I'm showing the standard OPC solution and in red, the curvilinear ILT solution for uh, many critical sites in the layout, in, in the full chip design. Uh, I'm plotting the depth of focus at 10% exposure latitude. So this is a common metric of process window uh, for the critical sites in the chip design. Um, particularly, we're going to focus on the process limiting site right here, which is the minimum depth of focus uh, location in the chip. Uh, this particular case, it's uh, three contacts that are isolated from any other feature. And uh, by applying an unconstrained, uh, fully curvilinear ILT solution, we can almost double the depth of focus at 10% exposure latitude. Uh, I want to make a comment here for the mask making community as well, is that once you have one, a solution like this on mask, uh, like you see in the same picture, it becomes very difficult now to distinguish what is a main feature, what's an assist feature. Everything looks like main now. Everything is curvilinear. Everything seems to have the same level of importance. Uh, you know, maybe you can clearly see here uh, array contacts for a word line, and maybe you can distinguish some other row of contacts, but it, it's, it's hard to tell what's, what's main, what's a sys feature anymore. 
So comparing these two cases, you have in the top row, again, the conventional OPC solution with conventional assist features. And at the bottom case, you have a fully unconstrained curvilinear ILT uh, showing that in simulation, um, we're uh, gaining about 85% increase in depth of focus. Um, and you can see PB band also being much tighter in the fully curvilinear case than in the, um, in the standard case. Uh, now, let me comment that even though this uh, outer contour here may look like part of the uh, PB band and you may think, oh, that doesn't look that good, that's actually the mask shape. We're overlaying it to the OPC mask shape. So in this case, it's rectilinear in the conventional OPC. In the case of IoT, it's fully curvilinear. So that's the mask shape, uh, not, not part of the PB band. And lastly, I want to um, show about the pattern fidelity of these curvilinear shapes, uh, how they look on mask and how well, how well they match the uh, intent, the design intent or the mask data. So in blue outline, you see the uh, mask data overlaid to the same picture of the mask. Uh, these are the same three contacts that I showed in the example uh, before. But in this case, we've used a different ILT treatment, uh, generating different kinds of assist features, actually very aggressive donut style assist features uh, to avoid printing. Uh, and you can see that even in the most challenging cases, pattern fidelity is uh, very good. Uh, another example of more of an array type contacts uh, with curvilinear assist features around and this dot assist features, uh, mask pattern fidelity is uh, really good. Um, I should also mention this is uh, joint work between Micron and collaboration with Nuflair and uh, D2S uh, for these mask patterns. So in conclusion, I hope I showed you uh, different applications of ILT and curvilinear masks uh, in memory designs. Um, I, I truly believe that uh, multi-beam mask writers are an enabler for curvilinear shapes, making it to manufacturing and extending immersion lithography as well as multi-patterning on memory designs uh, by allowing us to take advantage of the ultimate uh, process window we can obtain. Uh, so curvilinear masks, I think, are going to be part of high volume manufacturing. Um, and uh, with the introduction of state-of-the-art multi-beam riders, uh, those are possible today. Now, I should say that some, some challenges uh, still exist, as we covered uh, in this talk, uh, but overall, uh, we're, we're there today. So thank you very much for your attention. And